You're listening to The Weather Junkies. Oh, boy. Large wedge tornado coming up in Chicago. A winter storm warning is in effect for our area. We can expect at least another two to four inches for the night. Then that snow. Good Thursday evening. Thank you for joining us on the Weather Junkies. I'm Tyler Jankowski joining the show from Plattsburgh, New York. Dakota is joining in from Colorado. Dakota. In, in Plattsburgh when he comes back. Uh, but I'm going to dive straight into the what's trending in the weather verse, or in this case, what's trending in the climate verse, because I kind of have a little bit of a rant here. Um, so starting out, we're going to go with a video, actually, from CNBC. Uh, we usually don't, uh, we usually only use tweets, but I'm going to go with, uh, we'll play the audio right now um, of something that they aired today. And then I'll have a little bit of a commentary. But first, let's go to that audio. One other thing, just, just to get to the nitty gritty. Do you believe that it's been proven that CO2 is the primary control knob for climate? Do you believe that? No, I, no, I think that, that measuring with precision uh, human activity on the climate is something very challenging to do. And there's tre tremendous disagreement about the, the degree of impact. Uh, so, so no, I would not agree uh, that's a primary contributor uh, to the to the global warming that we see. Okay, All right, but we don't know that yet. As far as we, we need to, we need to continue the debate and to continue the review and the analysis. It's 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 a I agree. When I hear the science has settled, it's like I I never heard that science actually gotten to a point where it was. So that's that's the whole point of science is that uh, you keep asking questions, you keep asking questions, but. I want to be called a denier, so uh, you know, scares me. It's, it's a terrible thing to be called. Anyway, Administrator Pruitt, I know you don't want to be called that either. Um, thanks for being with us this morning. I appreciate it. Thank. This audio blows my mind. That was um, an interview on CNBC with uh, some moderator. I don't, I don't know the name of the moderator, but they were interviewing the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, who has just been. Um, nominated and approved by our Senate. And it blows my mind that he doesn't, he doesn't think that CO2 is a primary driver of global warming or climate change. Um, I, I'm a TA right now for a, a 100 level class in, for undergrads. And even they know that CO2 is a primary driver of global warming and climate change. The guy who's protecting our air, water, and land doesn't know the simple facts of CO2 drives, um, CO2 just drives climate in general. Look back um, millions, thousands of years, CO2 drives our climate. Uh, you know, there are other things that drive our climate, but CO2 is a big part of that, not just in the recent hundred years. Um, so I'll stop my rant there, Tyler. I think you're back, right? 
I am back. I um, continue to be uh, dumbfounded by Google's reliability. I had to uh, uninstall and reinstall the app on my phone, and then it worked. But whatever. Oh. Well, that's another whole podcast episode. <laughs> yeah, problems with Google Hangouts. Um, so let's just go straight into our next tweet here. Uh, this tweet is from good friend. I actually met him. Actually, I just met him, so I guess he can't be a good friend. But Rick Smith, he is the warning coordination meteorologist uh, in the National Weather Service in Norman. He's also a panelist on Weather Brains, and his tweet says, "My phone is filling up with weather podcasts." Hashtag NWPM. NWPM stands for National Weather Podcast Month, and he has a picture there of all the podcasts that he's listening to. Cut. He, we're on his list of, of podcast listens. I know. It's a nice tweet. I love all the different graphics. And I wonder how long some of these have been around. I think a lot of them are fairly new. Yeah, so um, us and, well, I guess Carolina Weather Group's not up here. Weather Brains has been around for, uh, what, over 10 years now? Ages. Eight years? Oh, it's eight years? Ages, I said. <laughs> I know. Oh, ages, yeah. I know they have uh, over 500 episodes, so do the math there. They do one every week. Um, Weather Hype is new. It was, I like, think, launched back in the last year, this time last year. And same with Stormfront Freaks, this time last year. Tornado Talk has been around for a little longer, though. Um, and obviously, we started in November of 2015. So, yeah, it's the, the golden era of weather podcasts, I guess. Um, so our next tweet is also a podcast tweet. Uh, you'll find a trend here in a few of our few tweets here. This tweet comes from Weather Hype. Uh, good friends, Min and Castle run that podcast over there. And their tweet says, new episode. We are joined by Weather Dak from Weather Junkies to discuss storytelling and narrative, narrative communication. Hashtag NWPM. So I was lucky enough to be on their show last week and, uh, or, I guess it was this week. Yeah, this week I was on the show. We recorded a while back, and it was a blast. Uh, so I highly recommend listening uh, to any of their episodes. Um, I was on episode 25. You can find them on iTunes. Uh, Weather Hype is their name, and uh, you can follow them on Twitter, at Weather Hype. Um, great podcast. Do you have any tweets, Tyler? And the tweet says, just finished sound check with Reed Timmer, Accu, for tonight's show at 9 p.m. Uh, I suppose that's a podcast, another podcast interviewing Reed Timmer. Yeah, so this is the, um, this is the Stormfront Freaks. And the reason I put this in here is because I'm going to be on the show. So immediately after our show... At not, at 9 p.m. Eastern, pretty much right after we re finish recording, I'm going to be on that show. So if you're still craving weather podcast stuff, head on over there. And uh, really excited to talk with Reed. I I met him once in person, but I'm super pumped to talk to him a little longer. And all the people over there at the Stormfront Freaks. Our final tweet is from Ryan Maui, and this is a fascinating tweet that he put out a couple days ago and he says uh, it's a quote loss of short to medium range tropical cyclone and intensity forecast skill for atlantic basin in proposed 2017 gfs is unacceptable to the national hurricane center that is a quote from the national hurricane center and they provided a graphic a graph comparing the current gfs with the GFS that is apparently going to be put into operational use at some point this year. And there is a clear decline in the new version's skill with tropical cyclones. They are using frequency of superior performance. I don't know what goes into that, but I do know that if you look at the bar graph, they provided the frequency of superior performance on the new GFS is not as good as the current one. And apparently the Hurricane Center is upset about this. Wow. I wonder what sort of internal communication the National Hurricane Center has provided to headquarters. To I was discussing this with another meteorologist today, and uh, we came to the conclusion that there must be something, there must be something good or really good in the model in order to release it with this much of a negative when it relates to 
Hurricanes? I, I don't know. Um, I haven't really studied the new release, but this is a little bit alarming. Uh, but the Euro is consistently better already, so maybe this just tells us to use more of the Euro? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I... I honestly don't know much about modelology. It's, you know, the National Air Service strives to improve it every year. And um, our guest actually tonight, uh, Dr. Louis Uccellini, is the director of the National Weather Service, and he briefly touches on this. Um, so I, too bad we don't have him live on the show. He could address this directly. Uh, but um, we, uh, we have schedules outside of the podcast, so every once in a while there's a recording, and I'm sure this recording is a is a great one. It's very exciting to have such a big name on the show, like the director of the National Weather Service. So uh, I'm excited to get started with the interview. Are you, Dakota? Yeah, so uh, let's jump right into that. I'll, I'm going to give him a little bit of an intro here because I didn't do it in the recording. Uh, Dr. Uccellini has a story career in the National Weather Service. He's served in a plethora of leadership roles. Uh, right now, he's the director of the National Weather Service, and he served as the head of the National Center for Environmental Prediction for over 14 years. And that center basically oversees the operations of um, a bunch of centers, nine centers, that includes the Storm Prediction Center, Climate Prediction Center, and National Hurricane Center, uh, to name three of the nine uh, he's been with the National Weather Service for, I think, 25 years, uh, maybe over 25 years. And uh, one of the cooler things that I think he's done is he co-authored, uh, you know, besides running the National Weather Service, another cool thing that he did uh, was he co-authored Northeast Snowstorms uh, with Paul Kosin, who we actually had on the show about a year ago. And this book is awesome. It basically gives a recap of every East Coast snowstorm, and I, you know, it, it, I think it's inspired a lot of a lot of meteorologists in the East, especially if you're a big snowstorm person. Um, and so, yeah, if, if you haven't read that, I would definitely uh, check out Northeast Snowstorms. And finally, Dr. Uccellini received his PhD, Masters, and Bachelors, all in meteorology, from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, so it's a 24-minute interview. So um, we'll get to that right now. What got you hooked in, in meteorology and weather? Uh, when was it that you knew you, you, know, you wanted to, to be a meteorologist? Well, my parents um, to tell the story that, um, as I was um, just starting to walk and talk um, as a kid on Long Island, um, I would point up to the clouds and uh, you know, either try to articulate or grunt or whatever I was doing. And, um, and as I was learning how to talk, I was, um, it, it was obvious to them I was excited about uh, when it was snowing out or if something exciting was happening outside. So even before a time I can remember, I was apparently very interested in what was going on around me. But, uh, you know, the bottom line with respect to that, to asking when did I, uh, how far back does it go that I was interested in meteorology as far back as I remember? Yeah, and and so you, you wrote the, the book on snowstorms called Northeastern Snowstorms with uh, Paul Kosin. And I, I was wondering if, if as, a, as a child or in high school or in college, were, were snowstorms the thing that really hooked you or did, were you into everything weather? Well, I was, I was definitely interested in snowstorms, and that's the very first... Uh, I remember I was just interested in snow. It could just be snowing and not sticking, and I got excited uh, as a as a little kid. Of course, my um, I I became more and more um, um, you know demanding of snow that actually stuck, and then demanding that it, you know that when are we going to get the big one, right? Uh, but it it was really a primary forcing uh, for my interest in in meteorology. Uh, during the 1950s, we also had a series of tropical storms that passed over Long Island, uh, and uh, and then in 1960, Hurricane Donna went right over my um, right over my town. So um, that was pretty exciting. And uh, between the uh, hurricane in September, uh, Hurricane Donna in the September of 1960, and then we had uh, a major uh, uh, snowstorm in December of 1960, and then um, we had. Uh, 
two uh, very big snowstorms in January and February of 61. You know, that whole period of time from September of 1960 with Hurricane Donna all the way to the February snowstorm on, uh, in 1961, uh, it was like uh, it was like Nirvana for me. Uh, I mean, it was just one exciting thing after another happening. So if I wasn't hooked by that time, I was certainly uh, hooked after uh, 6061. That's that's really what I wanted to do was yeah. study, uh, study meteorology. Yeah, so I'm I'm similar. The snowstorms. I, I grew up in Maryland, and uh, I 2009 2010 was a huge year. Uh, there and and I'm sure you were in the area as well um, and I heard that we may be getting a update within the in the book or a new volume with some of these snowstorms is that true because I if so I'm I'm so excited because you know I lived in those snowstorms and would love to see uh, you and Paul's analysis on them the career journey um, uh, for me was the when I went to the University of Wisconsin I certainly got interested even more interested in the research more interested in severe weather and and uh, snowstorms and the relationships of dynamical and physical processes to it. When I went to NASA, this, uh, Goddard Space Flight Center in the late 70s and early 80s is where I hooked up with Paul Cosin, and um, he proposed uh, the outline uh, for the uh, monograph, and I certainly uh, was excited about it and, and was encouraging factor and a major contributing factor to uh, in, in getting these books started. Uh, so, you know, that, that's really a major highlight of, uh, of my career, and I know uh, for Paul, he, he'd say the same thing. And uh, we are, um, we, ha we have outlined a volume three, it's, it's an update to uh, volume two, and um, an update to um, our knowledge of, of uh, you know, trying to report on the knowledge basis for uh, not only understanding these storms uh, and, 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 and their development, but also how we um, how we forecast them and how how we've improved the forecast. And um, I think the January 2016 storm was sort of a marker for our career since you know, my role here, I had to give a national news conference and Paul was working the winter weather desk at the same time in the Weather Prediction Center. Um, you know, we were 50 feet away from each other doing what we enjoy doing. So wow. uh, if, you know, volume three is, is in the works, and uh, it's a slow, it's always slow getting these things done, and with the position I have and the work that Paul's doing, of course, uh, you know, it, it does slow it down a bit, but uh, we are uh, looking to the uh, you know, early 2020s to uh, get that volume three done. That's great. I uh, look forward to it. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, the National Weather Service and the, the role that you have there. Uh, I'm curious, from your perspective, what are uh, what's the biggest challenge that faces the National Weather Service, and what are you doing to address that challenge? Well, there's a number of challenges, and um, uh, one of the big challenges that I encountered coming here is is rebuilding the infrastructure um, of the National Weather Service. Um, as, as a trip, for example, the dissemination system had to be completely replaced and we've made great progress on that but we're not done yet and we still got work to do um the uh we have been very busy getting the computing capacity uh established that we need uh, there's another upgrade coming uh with our uh, ibm slash cray system um you know we have a dual system now both primary and backup and um we have an upgrade coming uh on that so you know, um, so that's really important. Uh, of course, as we build the data assimilation capability, the modeling capability, the modeling post-processing capability it relies in part on what computing capacity you have. It's not all computing capacity, but you certainly have to have that as a critical ingredient. And of course, we've focused on um, service life extension uh, programs for our NextRad and for uh, we're just uh, getting on the front end of a, uh, an extension program for our ACE sources. So you can see in all of these aspects, there are infrastructure um, and capacity issues that we need to focus on. Now, having said that, we can't lose sight of the fact that we have a, a lot of model uh, development slash implementation. We have partnerships developing with the research community in, uh, in universities and in federal labs internationally. 
so we have um, a number of areas that we're working there. Um, and then um, the, the, I'd say the most fundamental thing that we're working towards is completing the forecast, going beyond the forecast and warning and linking with decision making um, in ways that we hadn't done before. This is the, uh, the basis for building a weather ready nation. And um, I think we've made tremendous progress there. It's a, it's a major shift uh, for our forecasters throughout the weather service. And it's also representing a major shift for decision makers like emergency managers and water resource managers that we work with, that they become much more proactive ahead of an event rather than just reacting to an event. So um, that um, is really a um, pretty exciting uh, development for us. We've made great progress, but we got a lot of work to do. So, uh, so there's a spectrum of challenges that we're, um, um, we're working towards. Um, uh, and I, I couldn't prioritize them. We gotta, we gotta work yeah. on all of them. Uh, so, so one thing that is, I, I think that it's an issue for not just the National Weather Service, not just the weather community, but any, any source of information, any, any organization that disseminates information is, is getting through the noise um, of, of, of news and information. And, you know, sometimes the message that, that needs to get out can get muddled. Uh, so I'm curious if you could touch on um, an initiative or two that the National Weather Service is pursuing to more clearly and effectively communicate forecasts. Well, uh, well there's a couple of issues there that you point to. Uh, first of all, we're, we're, we are embracing the larger community, uh, the, the enterprise as it's called, um, in, in many ways. Uh, and one of them is through the uh, Weather Ready Nation, uh, building a Weather Ready Nation program, we've uh, created this uh, uh, ambassador initiative where organizations sign up to be Weather Ready Nation ambassadors, <clears throat> which keeps us in continued communication with them uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, safety campaigns, uh, preparing for actual events, uh, at least alerting to actual events. Um, the idea here is um, not only to get people on board with the idea that uh, those organizations are important uh, in terms of building a weather ready nation, but we can uh, maintain some kind of consistent messaging that goes out uh, with respect to an impending event. So um, that's the challenge. Um, you know, uh, we, um, we have a free speech in this country, and we recognize that. And, um, and that's obviously very important to all of us. Um, when we come up to these events, we have to ensure that at least within the weather service, we have a consistent message out. That's come back loud and clear from the emergency management community. But I think the, the, the responsible people in the community and, and the, um, uh, within the enterprise recognize this as, as a very important aspect too. And we do, we do have um, ways of communicating with the media, uh, as we prepare our products, at least starts alerting them to where uh, we're going with the particular system. They come back to us and, and present alternatives, um, different focus areas, and we certainly listen to them and we factor that in. Uh, it's, it's, it's really evolved into a really great relationship. And um, I think you're seeing more consistent messaging going out. Um, uh, but the, there are, will be times when other messages will get out and things, and we just have to make sure that we stay uh, true to, um, you know, our mission needs and uh, the way we communicate the forecast as we're approaching an event. So uh, one thing that that the National Weather Service does and is hoping to do more in the future is providing forecasts um, on an impact-based, uh, which is called impact-based decision support services. Uh, for those of you listening who don't know about IDSS, <clears throat> it's an initiative by the National Weather Service to, to really get their forecasters in, in direct contact with emergency management and event coordinators during high impact weather events. Um, so, so we've heard from you, Dr. Uccellini, recently about um, IDSS and kind of becoming that, that becoming more, um, more of a thing in the National Weather Service, more prominent in the National Weather Service. I, I was wondering if you could touch on the the transition to, to becoming more IDSS heavy 
and what might, what might be in store for the National Weather Service? Yes, uh, so it, you know the, the basic um, aspect of this is that um, back, let's say, let's go into the 90s and even the early part of this century, uh, right through the first decade, uh, many forecasters, uh, I would say within the enterprise, uh, uh, would measure themselves entirely on the accuracy of the forecast or uh, the lead time of a warning, uh, et cetera. Um, what we found is that if the, in terms of actually getting the response to the information we can bring to the table, you have to go beyond the forecast and warning. You have to be working with those who are making decisions um, uh, that um, for a community, uh, whether it's uh, local emergency management, um, first responders, et cetera, um, and you have to connect with them. And, and that's... And that's what uh, was the basis of the impact-based decision support service. It really became part of that strategic activity at first uh, uh, when we rolled out the Building a Weather Ready Nation uh, strategic plan. The, um, the, the real key here is, is, is you, the forecasters have to understand that as a system evolves, and this is even as the forecast for that system evolves, how to communicate the uncertainty how to link to their key decision points. If you pass certain thresholds in forecast parameters or, or, or a forecast likelihood, the emergency management community, the water resource management community, and those are the two communities we're really focused on here, at the local, state, and federal levels uh, will, will react. They will go into their action plan. So we have to understand them as much as they need to understand what we do and and what's involved with our forecast and the uncertainties in those forecasts before they actually make a decision and um and this is not something you just do the day before an event uh, you have to establish the relationships you have to establish the protocols you have to practice 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 you have to be at every single one of their tabletop exercises so that we can understand exactly what will transpire when, um, uh, when we pass a certain threshold. So uh, this is true for any kind of a, an extreme event you could think of, whether it's the hurricane at landfall, uh, fire weather possibilities, severe weather possibilities, um, blizzards, floods. Um, you know, there's a different uh, step up to the decisions that have to be made, uh, different reactions. The key is, is that they're making their decisions earlier and earlier. Uh, they need more and more lead time to uh, pre-position assets. So we have to be working with them seven days, six days, five days, four days before an event. As soon as that forecast likelihood starts spinning up, we're working with them, and they're now making decisions at days four, three, and two before an event, and it's based upon these impact-based decision support services which now include us embedding uh, our forecasters uh, on an episodic basis in their uh, operation centers. So it's uh, really, this linkage has really been important. Um, we've had some examples lately where it's been tremendously successful. Uh, the New Orleans tornado, um, if you talk to the MIC there, Ken Graham, he'll tell you it's, it's the work they've been doing over the last two or three years that's established these partnerships with the emergency manage management community and how they had everything working right up to that event in uh, New Orleans with an F3 tornado doing a tremendous amount of damage and no lives were lost. Um, it's, it really, it, it's really paying off and our forecasters are embracing it. Uh, and that's really important because this really has represented a major change to the total uh, work that has to be done uh, for us to realize our mission. I think it's a great initiative, and I the one example that really stands out to me is uh, in Chicago during the Lollapalooza uh, festival, um, where there was a line of storms that came through, and there was National Weather Service. I, I don't know if they were embedded or or if they were just communicating very heavily, but the evacuation was it seemed to me pretty flawless um, for that many people, um, and no one was. Um, injured or killed during that. So, um, so yeah. yeah, thank you for pursuing that um, even more. 
Right. So one of the things that I want to emphasize uh, for an event like that, we're still only working with the emergency management or the uh, the city officials. It's uh, really government to government. And, uh, and this is where the enterprise plays a big role because uh, a number of these events have uh, private sector uh, support. And so right. the, the key there is, is that uh, we're all uh, basically messaging the same threats, right? So that they get a consistent message. And uh, so we, we, a number of these Weather Ready Nation ambassadors uh, that we work with very closely are private sector uh, providers. And we've all bought into uh, the importance of working together uh, to ensure that their clients, um, our work with the city officials, uh, the state officials, uh, are all um, you know, working towards one goal, and that's to get the best response to an impending event. And um, um, I think that's, work, that's really uh, showing progress as well. One last thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, there's, the, there's been a point of contention uh, in, within the National Weather Service uh, Union um, about the weather forecasting offices becoming part-time. Um, is this something that may happen in the future? And if, if it is, how would that tra transition take place? Um, what we have found through the analysis um, from the McKinsey Company, uh, who first evaluated uh, several years ago uh, the status of the impact-based system support services and found that our forecasters embrace it and that our users are using it um, and that we should be pursuing um, um, the, the, the whole provision of IDSS. That's been a very important point, very important basis for us moving forward. What they found in the last, um, in the last evaluation, which they completed in uh, 2016, is that 94% of the IDSS is provided locally, that you absolutely need the local presence uh, for the successful um, IDSS and for the actions that are taken on the ground to save lives and mitigate property loss. The other thing they found is that in every, uh, every office, uh, there's, there's an increasing need for IDSS from the same officials so that we're not even meeting today's needs with today's infrastructure. And that is one of the major challenges for us is uh, now that people have seen the value of working with us, how do we manage uh, you know, meeting those needs? Um, no matter what scenario we go through, um, the, the distribution of offices we have is something that's very essential uh, for uh, not only meeting today's needs, but um, meeting tomorrow's needs. So, there are no plans uh, to close any forecast offices. Uh, quite frankly, um, uh, the union um, is using information that is readily available and uh, I think misrepresenting the, um, the results from that information. Uh, but I can tell you that there are no plans to close offices. In fact, um, we are working, remember I, I was emphasizing the infrastructure we are working to uh, build up the dissemination bandwidth in all the forecast offices. Uh, we are building a dual, uh, dual entryways into those forecast offices to uh, increase sustainability. Uh, we have gone through and um, dealt with the physical uh, uh, weaknesses in the buildings, the HVACs, uh, and some of them the roofs are being replaced. Uh, we understand that the current infrastructure is essential for providing the IDSS, making the, for, making the forecast, providing the warnings, uh, providing especially the IDSS, and, the, um, uh, and we're working towards that, not only for weather, but for water events. And it's, uh, it's extremely important uh, that we um, have the whole structure of the weather service uh, geared uh, towards um, uh, this, this um, um, notional aspect that the final decisions are made on the ground locally with those first responders, with those emergency managers dealing with the local forecast offices. So uh, we're certainly um, uh, want to proceed um, and build upon the success that we've had. And in that pathway does not include closing offices. 
Um, a lot of people look up to you. You're the director of the National Weather Service. You're the president of AMS, and the list of awards is you know goes on and on. So what what advice would you give to someone um, that looks up to you, that looks up to others in the National Weather Service who are in college now or in high school now, but they know they want to uh, be a meteorologist and maybe even be a part of the National Weather Service? Well, the first advice I give them is that everybody's uh, career journey is unique in, in many ways. Um, but one, one of the common uh, uh, basis points is uh, live your dream. Uh, meteorologists uh, usually uh, turned on to this topic as a young child, like I was. Uh, they have dreams about what, uh, what's involved with weather. Uh, they're, um, they want to know more. Um, they want to follow that pathway even if they don't quite understand what the pathway is. So that's, you know, that's what's really remarkable about the workforce I'm blessed with, and that's their, their dedication to mission, their commitment to what they do really stems from this unbelievable uh, love of what they do as it relates to weather, weather uh, features and meteorology in general, or hydrology. You know, the hydrologists are right up there uh, with the meteorologists from what I've seen in the National Weather Service. So you really got to live your dream. Um, the changes that are occurring now is that it's not just the physical science that you have to be um, uh, cognizant of. Um, it's, it's also the social sciences, the social sciences, if you want to link to decision makers. You, we, we have to have a better understanding of the human factors. We have to be able to connect better to these decision makers. And we're seeing this in universities. Um, we're seeing more and more uh, uh, now where universities are, are, are accounting for this need. And some schools like Millersville actually have a degree program at the master's level in emergency management, which has a meteorology minor. So there is there is this connectivity that we need to build on. And um, I would encourage the younger uh, generation to uh, to account for that and, and bring, you know, actually in a way complete the forecast uh, by their best connection to decision making. So, um, but there's still a lot of research problems out there. There are a lot of opportunities. Um, uh, in public and private sector, there are different ways of living the dream, but uh, I would just say don't lose the dream. I love that. Um, Dr. Giulini, thanks so much for taking some time to talk with us. All right, thank you. And that concludes our pre-recorded interview with the director of the National Weather Service. We are so appreciative of his time that he was able to take out of his day to come on the show. Uh, Decent interview there, a wide-ranging interview, obviously ending on the hot-button subject that is reorganization of the Weather Service and potential uh, shifting of exactly how things are done on the local level. But um, Yeah, what did you think about his response there? Well, he definitely emphasized that nothing will close. Um, and I think the fact that they're actually upgrading equipment, uh, we see this all over the place, the fact that they're actually upgrading some equipment, hardware, HVAC, obviously computer systems, is a very strong point to make that the office won't be closing. But perhaps the the greater question that people have is, what about part-time status overnight or when the weather is clear, something like that? Yeah. I So it, to me, it sounds like they don't have concrete plans to start ramping stuff down. but at certain WFOs, but um, in in the future, you know, there there may be WFOs that do start turning closer to part time. Um, but it doesn't sound like they have the plans ready yet to to implement that. Um, so yeah, this and means, I go ahead. The sense that I get is that they are working very hard to move the weather service forward, and whenever something like that happens there may be casualties along the way and maybe it's just going to take some time to figure out what that is. Casualties. <laughs> That's pretty, uh, pretty cruel there, Tyler. Um, yeah, but I, I had a great time. So uh, yeah, I'd like to thank Dr. Uccellini again for taking his time out of the you know busy schedule of planning and directing and doing everything for the national weather service. Um, I had to indulge him with the snowstorms because I'm, 
such a snowstorm weenie. Um, but I'm excited. They're, they're coming out with a new volume. Uh, him and Paul Kosen are going to do the snowstorms that you and I, Tyler, lived through and, you know, really became amateur meteorologist in. Yeah, so. and the one that you flew home for will probably, uh, <laughs> probably be included. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to see some of the – you know, some of the storms that stand out to me in the last couple of years, certainly there was one when I was at Penn State, the 2013 blizzard, about 40 inches in Connecticut. But then there was the one, uh, well, he'll have his work cut out for him for the winter of, um, what was it? Not last year, but the year before that, when Boston got their snowiest winter on record. I mean, it was just crazy storm after crazy storm. So, yeah. And then the Mid Atlantic. T 2009 and 2010 oh, yeah. is going to be a crazy one, too. It sounds like they've definitely allotted enough time, though. His timeline was early 2020s. <laughs> yeah, and I think Paul Kosen isn't uh, – I, I think he's taking a little time off to to get writing and get researching. Um, is at least what I – I talked to Paul at, at AMS this year and asked him about it, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to take a little step back from forecasting to um, – to focus on that a little more, but he is still forecasting actively at the, I believe he's at the weather prediction center. Uh, yes. You see his name every once in a while on the front <laughs> maps. Yeah. I used to do the Alaska forecast for a long time. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess that does it for our show tonight. Uh, great show. Uh, glad to have Dr. Uccellini on and glad he took some time to talk with us. Um, if you're not following us on Twitter or Facebook, do that. Uh, we're at Twitter at the WX Junkies, and you should listen to this podcast. If you're not listening live, uh, go ahead and listen on iTunes, or if you want to listen live, go ahead and listen on YouTube. And if you're listening on iTunes right now, please go ahead and give us a rating or review. You'll get a shout out on the show. I know that is uh, tempting. <laughs> and uh, everything you everything you've heard here, and some of the tweets and pictures that we talked about. You can find at our website at theweatherjunkies.com. And, uh, yeah, Tyler, what can we expect next week? Well, National Weather Podcast Month continues, and next week we have a large contingent from uh, the Stormfront Freaks, correct? And uh, Yeah, be it's actually going to be a, a potpourri of all the weather podcasts. Yeah. Um, and it's live, so... It'll be live, yeah. The title of the show is going to be When Weather Podcasts Collide. Hmm, that sounds like a don't miss. And after that, the following week, on March 23rd, we have guests, Min and Castle from Weather Hype. And to close out the month on the 30th, we have Joel Gratz. So... The slate continues here. We are, we'll be halfway through the month on next uh, week's episode. So we certainly hope you've been enjoying this, this month and uh, all of the podcasts that we do. Certainly send any recommendations that you might have our way. But for this episode, we are done. Thank you for listening. We hope that you'll join us right back here next week. Julia, we got cows.